Of course, she's most famous for the Titanic, but so many of these other episodes of her life are equally significant in American history to be able to champion workers' rights, while at the same time being the wife of one of the country's great industrialists. To be able to champion reform politics while being deeply enmeshed in a cultural and economic community that's supporting the status quo. She's representative of so many changes that are happening in American culture. The life of Margaret Brown spanned one of the greatest periods of change in American history. From her birth in a Mississippi River town to elegant Newport, Rhode Island, from the Colorado mines to the stages of New York and Paris, she had a starring role as a progressive reformer and a strong voice for human rights. Her actual significance was obscured by Hollywood and its manufactured moniker, Molly. But the true Margaret Brown story eclipses the movie mythology, revealing the rhythms of life in a rapidly changing nation. She shows us that you can be a person intoxicated with the material abundance of the late 19th century and early 20th century, and you can also be a person of conscience and a person of, of concern and compassion and willingness to act for the well-being of others. She was a very vibrant woman who was liberated decades ahead of her time. She had a degree of self-confidence and freedom that came with that self-confidence that allowed her to do things that were unexpected. Hannibal in the 1860s would have been a very exciting place to be. The population in Hannibal doubled between 1850 and 1860, and the largest ethnic group was the Irish. Margaret Tobin Brown was born in the bustling river town of Hannibal, Missouri in 1867 to Irish immigrant parents John and Johanna Tobin. The Tobins joined a wave of immigration to America in the mid-1800s resulting from famine and depression in Ireland. Both had a history of activism. Johanna's family had ties to the Irish resistance, and John supported the Underground Railroad, a Civil War-era network offering safe passage north to runaway slaves. Like many of their countrymen, they eventually followed economic opportunities to the growing industrial town on the banks of the Mississippi. In other parts of Missouri, uh, being sensitive to the plight of African Americans, uh, being anti-slavery or having abolitionist leanings would have gotten you in real trouble. That an Irish Catholic immigrant family without a great deal of money would have been anti-slavery. That's extraordinarily unusual and really suggests that they were quite a progressive family that was really strongly politically engaged. The Tobin's progressive views also extended to education, even for their daughters. Margaret attended school until age 13, when she began working at a tobacco factory to help support her family. It was there that she first experienced the struggles of a new laboring class, created by the forces of industrialization and technology. Long days, low wages, and instability characterized the lives of many in Hannibal and throughout the nation. By 1880, many looked westward for the prospect of a better future. The significance of the Mississippi River system is decreasing very rapidly as railroads become more important. And so many of the people that had gone to these river towns like Hannibal would have been lured further west by additional economic opportunity, uh, for instance, the mineral strikes in the mountains of Colorado. In 1886, 19-year-old Margaret Tobin left her home in Hannibal, Missouri to visit her brother Daniel in Colorado. This departure would mark the first of many auspicious journeys that would take her around the world and through the great movements of her time.
The Colorado mountain towns in the periods immediately after a significant strike were instant cities, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, a variety of different languages spoken on the streets. They were extraordinarily exciting places to be. There was the sense sort of hanging in the air that it was possible that anyone who was there could become rich. In the late 1880s, Leadville, Colorado was the silver mining capital of the nation. Harrison Avenue teemed with activity. Freight wagons, borough trains, prospectors, cowboys, and people from all walks of life. But the alluring promise of instant wealth was, for most people, a fantasy. In a town of transience, crime, racial strife, labor disputes, and violence were endemic. It had a much higher percentage of men than women. It had uh, some really wild places and saloons and ill-behaved people. And it's not particularly well-regulated in terms of enforced social norms on how to behave and encountering women in the streets. It's not a place for a delicate soul. Margaret Tobin decided to stay in Leadville with her brother, finding work as a sales clerk at Daniels Fisher and Smith's department store. The hardscrabble mining life in Leadville offered her a first-hand view of an industry built on the backs of poorly paid laborers working long hours under harsh and dangerous conditions. When a miner was injured or became ill, he left behind a family that was destitute. And I think that's part of the reason why she was so compassionate with respect to miners' rights and workers' rights her entire life. Margaret soon became active in Leadville's Irish Catholic community. At a church picnic, she was introduced to a mining engineer with respectable prospects, but no fortune. Like herself, James Joseph Brown was intelligent, gregarious, and ambitious. Following a three-month courtship, Margaret and JJ were married at Annunciation Church on September 1, 1886. Within a few years, Margaret was tending to the needs of their two children, Lawrence and Helen. JJ worked long hours at the mines, supervising men and operations. At home in the evenings, he studied engineering and geology books. Throughout the nation, industrialization rapidly transformed American life. No longer a country of independent farmers, Americans increasingly sought work in factories and mines. A widening chasm of class division between the captains of industry and impoverished laborers created an atmosphere of conflict and distrust. While JJ struggled to balance the expectations of the mine owners with the needs of the miners, Margaret was a tireless volunteer for the poor and disenfranchised. In 1893, an act of Congress repealed a law requiring the government to purchase silver for coins. Leadville's economy came crashing down in a pile of devalued ore. The repeal of the Sherman Silver Act caused an immediate crash in the silver market. This was a catastrophe for the entire West, though it was particularly felt in a place like Leadville where silver was everything. It led to rampant unemployment. Many people lost fortunes very, very quickly. In the midst of the silver chaos, J.J. Brown engineered the fortuitous although well-researched discovery of gold beneath the shifting dolomite sands of the Little Johnny Mine. Margaret and JJ became instant millionaires. Many Leadville mines returned to full production, searching this time for gold. With the ability to improve both their lifestyle and location, the Browns moved to Denver and purchased their home on Pennsylvania Avenue in 1894. After a decade of rapid urbanization, Denver was a city facing significant struggles. Slums, homelessness, and poverty were among the challenges that mobilized a new cadre of progressive reformers, and Margaret Brown was among them. Many of these women were swept up with the times in which they were supposed to look at the world around them and see that the women's role in the house could be extended outside of that, that the world was their household. Margaret pressed for social reform, urging Denver officials to install public bathrooms, parks, and playgrounds, and make the city more livable for all citizens. Her work with controversial Denver judge Ben Lindsay helped pioneer the creation of the nation's first juvenile court system. In an attempt to rejuvenate an ailing marriage, 
Margaret and JJ embarked on a world tour, but the trip failed to bridge the distance between them. After continued periods apart, the couple legally separated in 1909. By the end of the decade, Margaret had established herself in social and political circles in the eastern U.S. and Europe. After touring Egypt in 1912, she received a cable urging her immediate return to the States to assist her gravely ill grandson. She booked passage on the first available ship, the wonder of the modern age, Titanic. While progressive reformers struggled with the consequences of the industrial era, the potential for new technologies to improve human life seemed unlimited. The great ocean liner Titanic represented the pinnacle of innovation and achievement, a testament to man's superiority over nature. When the ship sank on its maiden voyage in 1912, many Americans began to question the limits of technology. Margaret Brown's experiences on the Titanic have been relegated to legend. But in the aftermath of the tragedy, Margaret's role in helping survivors placed her in the national spotlight for the first time. She would use this opportunity to expand her reach in promoting the progressive ideas and issues close to her heart. Once they were rescued by the Carpathia, Margaret Brown worked very hard to make sure that the survivors were well taken care of, regardless of class. She spoke several languages, so she was able to talk to people and help them, comfort them. And then when the Carpathia actually came into New York Harbor, she stayed on board until every person had disembarked and made sure that they had a place to go, whether it was an embassy or the home of a friend or family. The Titanic sank as an era of unbridled capitalism in America was reaching its zenith. Immigrants poured into American cities and industry in record numbers. The widening division between capital and labor bred conflict that sometimes erupted in violence. In 1914, tensions came to a head in the coal mines of Southern Colorado, many of which were owned by one of the nation's leading industrialists, John D. Rockefeller. Miners worked six or seven days a week, 12 to 15 hours a day. They lived in company-owned houses. They shopped at the company store. There were no schools for the children. They wanted to start a union. They wanted to work an eight-hour day. They wanted some guarantee of a minimum wage. They were asking for very basic things, and the mining company was not willing to negotiate. When the strike began, the coal companies evicted 11,000 workers and their families from their homes. Union organizers established tent colonies, including one near Ludlow, while strikers endured escalating harassment from private security agents and the state militia. On April 20th, 1914, gunfire broke out between the coal company's militia and striking miners. Six miners were killed in the fighting, while two women and 11 children suffocated when fire engulfed the camp. Armed workers took to the hills, battling the militia for over 10 days, while people across the nation urged President Woodrow Wilson to intervene. The Ludlow Massacre rips the veil off U.S. labor relations and industrial conditions and just makes it clear that the United States has ended up where it never wanted to end up, uh, replicating Europe in some of its class divisions and some of the violence used to keep working class people in their place. Firing on a camp of families in tents and losing the lives of children and women, that's as bad as it can get. The complacency can't be the response to that. Like Mother Jones and other activists, Margaret Brown went to Ludlow. But appeals for her help came from both sides, management and labor. She acted as an intermediary because she knew the Rockefellers they were absolutely opposed to any sort of negotiation with the miners. When John D. Rockefeller Jr. refused to capitulate, Margaret traveled the country, advocating miners' rights and pressuring him with negative media. No one understands like the Colorado women the situation, and they are the ones who must make Rockefeller see things as they are. He is merely holding out for the right to run his business as he sees fit. Now, if he has shown that he cannot do that, that the rights of other people must be considered, he is bound to see things aright. 
Margaret Brown. The national outrage over Ludlow was never vindicated. In the face of financial and public relations losses, Rockefeller made some concessions, but real changes in the miners' quality of life were minimal. The official investigation in Colorado placed blame for the violence on the strikers. 1912 and 1913 were a sort of golden year for progressive politics and therefore for women in politics. In 1912, Theodore Roosevelt had bolted the Republican Party and run as an independent on the Progressive Party ticket or the Bull Moose ticket. And it was a key element of the Progressive Party that it was going to bring women into politics. By 1913, the National Women's Suffrage Movement was based in Newport, Rhode Island. The pinnacle of American high society, wealthy Newport families displayed their fortunes with spectacular homes and lavish parties. It was the first American town to have a golf course, a tennis club, and the regular use of cars. Women dominated society while their husbands engaged in business in New York City. When Margaret Brown came to Newport, it was the few years before the beginning of the First World War. This was Newport at its peak. She did not have the kind of money that some of her friends in Newport had. But the thing that Margaret had that Newport society loved was she was colorful, she was interesting, she was eccentric. She spoke a number of languages, she was well-traveled. Newport's leaders quickly accepted Margaret and she developed a close friendship with Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, president of the National Women's Suffrage Association. Margaret traveled the country, speaking and writing about women's rights and labor issues. She also became involved with the more radical side of the women's movement, led by Alice Paul, which pushed hard for a constitutional amendment giving women the right to vote. Women in that era who stepped out of their assigned gender roles were criticized as being unfeminine. They were thought to be against the family. If women took power, the family would fall apart. All of these were criticisms which haven't completely gone away. In 1914, Margaret worked with Alva Belmont on the Conference of Great Women a summit that became known for its location at Alva's Newport Cottage, Marble House. The invitation was extended to activists of all social classes, creating controversy and disdain among some of Newport's elite, who admonished Alva for letting loose a horde of fanatics in their cloistered community. The two-week conference attracted women from all walks of life who renewed their dedication and inspiration for the cause of suffrage. Each speaker seemed more fervent than her predecessor, until one could feel the audience being carried higher and higher toward a newer idealism of women's work and her ever-growing responsibility to maintain it. Every speaker made the urgent necessity of the ballot the high point in her address, and through it all ran a note of time, democracy. Doris Stevens. The momentum created by the Conference of Great Women and the support of national suffrage leaders propelled Margaret Brown to run for national political office in 1914 as a U.S. Senator from Colorado. Colorado newspapers, the New York Times, and her influential friend Judge Ben Lindsay endorsed her candidacy. I believe that the men of Colorado would be willing to send a woman to Washington. If I do go to the Senate, I shall be specially interested in all matters relating to women and children. In general, I shall stand for the human side of every question. Margaret Brown. Margaret's ambitions took an unexpected turn with the onset of World War I, when her sister's marriage to a German aristocrat employed by the emperor became a political liability. She withdrew from the campaign trail to help with establishing medical relief facilities in France, ultimately earning the French Legion of Honor Award. A number of Americans were very taken with the idea of defending uh, our sister republic in France against the onslaught of the Germans. They would drive ambulances or somehow support the war effort. And a number of them stayed after that because Americans were very much appreciated in Paris in 1918 and it was very cheap for them to live well there. 
There is a general movement of disaffected um, artistic and cultural Americans to Europe. It becomes a stimulating place for people like Hemingway, Alice B. Toklas, and Gertrude Stein in Paris. So Margaret becomes a part of that scene. After passage of a national women's suffrage amendment in 1920, Margaret concentrated more of her energies on theater and acting. She emulated one of her heroes, Sarah Bernhardt, performing her famous role in Les Glands in Paris and New York. In September of 1922, after months of respiratory illness, J.J. Brown passed away in a New York hospital. The legal battle over his estate was lengthy and contentious, dividing the family and pitting Margaret against her two children. Skyscrapers are built by holding certain forces in tension, and they can rise very high by doing that. And it's a good emblem for what's going on in the United States in the 1920s. There's a kind of tug-of-war in the culture between the forces of conservatism and the forces of modernity. And so holding those forces in tension is what's driving culture forward, and it's what's driving the skyscraper upward. In the 1920s, New York City blossomed as the cultural capital of the nation, an American Paris, full of new energies and modern amenities. African Americans migrated from the South as immigrants arrived from around the world, contributing their cultures to a city pulsing with music, art, and theater. It was a time of freedom and exploration that was now open to women. By the late 1920s, Margaret Brown was drawn to New York with increasing regularity. In many ways, she was the embodiment of the new woman of the 20s, free, liberated, and self-sufficient. The 1920s were characterized by the flappers, by the jazz babies, by the very thin cigarette-smoking, automobile-driving young women that you would expect in The Great Gatsby. They really represented a kind of war against that Victorian model of womanhood. At the dawn of the 1930s, Margaret continued to travel while studying and teaching acting and performing scenes for charity benefits and fundraisers. And she eventually moved to the Barbizon Hotel in New York City, which was an academy, a hotel for ambitious, aspiring young women who wanted to become actresses or writers. Margaret had a studio at the top floor there that was quite beautifully decorated, and she was teaching and acting. And I think it was a very happy period of her life, and she was very actively engaged with the world right up to the moment of her death. In October of 1932, in her room at the Barbizon Hotel, 65-year-old Margaret Tobit Brown passed away unexpectedly in her sleep. Her obituary in the Rocky Mountain News included an embellished account from her youth in Hannibal, claiming she was saved from drowning by none other than Mark Twain, a man she admired but in truth never met. Margaret Brown's theatrical style and everyday heroics help create the mythology that now defines her life. Today, her name is known around the world, a woman of titanic fame, memorialized on stage and screen. While the Molly Brown myth exposes the stereotype of the West and Western women, the true story of how she navigated a changing nation reflects the American experience in revealing ways. The real stories of the West are better than the products of the myth machine. If we look honestly, openly, realistically at the people who shaped the American West in the late 19th century, we will be more instructed, uplifted, entertained, educated than if we are off looking up at a screen watching mythic manufacturing underway. Margaret was more of a change maker. She didn't follow the trends, she set the trends. The life of Margaret Brown clearly demonstrates the limitations of putting historical figures into simple categories. That it is possible to rise from a poor immigrant background to the height of grand society, to have material abundance and be a person of conscience supporting opportunity for all. The true story of Margaret Brown transcends the limitations of myth, revealing a woman of extraordinary spirit and complexity who embodied the issues of her times and the power of individual action. <laughs>